table. My name is Cody, and I get to be one of the pastors here, and we are so glad that you guys are here with us today. We're going to be in Malachi chapter 3. Uh, we're going to start in verse 6, and we're going to read through verse 12, and so I'll read that for us. I'll pray for us. I'll let you be seated, and then we'll plow uh, through this text and see what God has to say to us today, okay? So, is that a deal? Everybody in agreement? All right, here we go. Here we go. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Jesus, um, we prayed it earlier when we sang that song, Lord, when, when your truth is hard to believe in, let our hearts be soft for receiving. And so, God, that's what we just echo again now. Um, we pray that you would encourage us where we need to be encouraged. We pray that you would convict us where we need to be convicted. And that, God, you would get your glory. Like as we preached in Habakkuk several, years, or several weeks ago, that your glory would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Lord, that's what we want. Um, but that, that has to start in our lives. So we ask that you that your glory would cover our lives, every aspect of our lives. And where it's not, where we're, we're not in lined up with you, Lord, that we just repent. Lord, may you encourage us and, and show us today that there is nothing that we can't repent of today. In your good, good name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you can have a seat again. If you're just coming in, welcome to the table. My name is Cody. Um, I hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving. How many of y'all ate way too much? Okay, hands all, okay, um, the rest of you, I know that you're not telling the truth, I know you did, get this hand, no, man, so, um, it, I, we had a great time, we had a great time, um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, I've, I've kind of struggled a little bit over this message this week, and the reason why is because if you've been coming to the table for very long, um, you'll know, and I, I think this is true, because I talked to one of our newcomers this, like, just this last week, and, and that's one of the things that he mentioned. He, go, he goes, y'all don't ever talk about money. I said, we talk about money every month. We talk about like the, he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, no, that you, you give like an update, but like, I'm, like you, don't, you don't hardly ever talk about money. I said, well, we're going to talk about it today. <laughs> so, so what I want to do is, is talk, in, in telling you this and in, in laying that out is like, this is one of the things about being part of a small church that you tend to know people. Now, I want to tell you this. I don't know what people give. I know some people give, and they're and you're. I know, I know that. I know some people don't, and but by God's grace, we're still in existence, and we're still paying our bills. We're still able to pay the rent to the school to to meet here, and we're slowly but surely chipping away and trying to work on a way we can get into a building one day. Um, but. But the people of God, it's more than just a building, and it's more than just a space. But it's certainly not less than that. And if you go back through history, they've always had a place. And if, if you go back through the minor prophets, God promised judgment, promised judgment because of the people's idolatry for the first nine of these, these, these prophets. They're called the pre-exilic prophets. The people would not repent, so he brought in a nation called Babylon, destroyed Jerusalem, they left the whole they left Jerusalem, which was where their temple was, so the people of God could not worship. They could not gather weekly and worship together and perform sacrifices and do all of the things that they were used to doing. And they were that way for several years. 
The last three prophets, which were in the last of those, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, they're called post-exilic prophets. And they prophesied to the people, spoke to God's people on behalf of God after they were able to come back to Jerusalem. The temple, they, they, they needed to go back. And Haggai says, listen, you're not, you're, you're, you're come back and you're building your homes, but you haven't resumed worship. You, my house lies in ruins. The people that got a fire lit under them and they fixed the temple and they resumed the worship. And Zechariah prophesied about getting their hearts right. Malachi comes along and he says, you're doing these things and you're worshiping again, but it's just out of ceremony. The, what was going on, they, they still weren't having crops. And this is what he's addressing here. The book of Malachi is basically six accusations that God makes against his people. So you, you say, well, if you're coming in here, and you're like, why'd you pick money? Listen, I had to pick one of the accusations. We're, we're covering the whole book. I'm not, I'm not giving you all six of them, but we had to pick one. And this is the one, and we're going to go ahead and just plow through it and deal with it. So God brings this disputation or this accusation against his people. His people don't even know what he's talking about. They thought that the land was cursed because it didn't matter what they did. It didn't seem like God was for them. It just seemed like God was against them. So they just stopped giving their money. They got cynical. Now, in the Old Testament, it was a law. It was a law. Like, you had to give money so that other people that were disadvantaged could be taken care of, so that the sacrifices could be done, so that the feasts were provided for, so that the whole, a whole tribe of people called the Levites could be taken care of because they didn't have land. They were dependent upon that. Like, it was a law in the Old Testament for God's people to give money. But they just stopped doing it. And, and more than just stop giving the money, they started bringing blemish sacrifices. They were supposed to bring perfect sacrifices, lambs without spot or blemish. They were supposed to bring the first fruits. And they stopped doing that. They started offering blind and lame lambs because of their cynicism. They thought God doesn't care about us. So why should we care about how we worship him? Now, they didn't go back into false idol worship. But their worship of God started to wane. Now here's the thing. This, this idea of cynicism. This idea that God isn't going to help us. That we have to figure this thing out for ourselves. You won't worship a God like that for long. If that's what you think about him. You won't worship him for very long. And so. This is the dangerous thing about relating to God with that kind of cynicism. You won't trust him when you need him the most. And things will start to spiral in your life. But because you're cynical toward him, you'll just keep turning to other things. And it'll get worse and worse and worse. The reason this is important for us is because we have such a propensity to worship ourselves. And we know that from the Garden of Eden. From Adam and Eve. Did God really say, God doesn't want you to know what he knows. He's keep, go ahead, take the, like, it's this idea. We have, a, I, we have this propensity, all of us, men, women, children, old, young, doesn't matter what our socioeconomic status is, doesn't matter what our ethnic background is, we all have this tendency to worship ourselves, to put our needs ahead of everybody else. I mean, it's even reinforced for us on planes. Put your mask on first, then help someone else. And, we, and that trickles down. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that and, dis, and you know, disobey the FAA, you know. But, but it, we, that gets reinforced. I'm looking out for me. I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to take care of me. That's where God's people were here in Malachi. And we have this propensity to worship ourselves, such a propensity... That mistrust of God and the self-sufficiency that inevitably follows that mistrust of God, it feels natural and right. But it's a lie. It's a lie. 
one illustration is the fact that one of these one time a long long time ago you were an a helpless infant that could not do anything on your own and it was because of the sacrifice of other people that you are alive and well here today you're not self sufficient it is in god that we move and have our being so I'm going to preach about money today, and I don't do that very often, but it's in our series, and the reason for it is because it reveals our heart. And I think that if there's anything that is an idol in our land, it is money, okay? Because we we turn to it for everything. In the Bible, and naturally so in some ways, like the Bible even says, Solomon said that money is not the answer for everything, but Solomon did say money has an answer for everything. And even in the New Testament, Paul, he says, it's not money that is the root of all evil. He says, but the love of money is the root of all evil. And so what I want us to do is as we look at Malachi and look at his word and see how God is asking his people to realign their hearts and to ask some examining questions about our relationship with money and where we put our hope and where we put our trust. So, three main areas we want to look at the accusation and how that brings awareness to this to the situation with malachi and we're with his people then we want to look at basically are the people going to accept this or not they're going to disagree with god and then what is the action steps to to be followed after that what what has to be done awareness acceptance action so let's go ahead and look at the accusation God says, return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? They, didn't even, they weren't even aware that they were away from him. God says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But they disputed it. And they said, how, are we, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, says the Lord. So first of all, let's distinguish between a tithe and a contribution. Or some versions say a tithe and an offering. Okay, A tithe is a tenth. Tenth. So let's do a little math here. What is one tenth of a dollar? Ten cents, a dime. What is ten percent of a hundred dollars? Ten dollars. What is ten percent of a thousand dollars? What is ten percent of a hundred thousand dollars? Ten thousand. There we go. You see it? What's ten percent of a million? 100,000. Okay, great. Y'all are geniuses. Y'all can figure this out. Great. You see all that? You're just moving zeros. That's all you're doing. Just moving decimal places. 10%. That's a tithe. That's what God told his people to bring. And if you go back and actually study the Old Testament, it wasn't just a tithe. They were also supposed to bring other offerings and other sacrifices at different feasts. Some scholars have calculated it up that by the time you add it all up, it could have been anywhere from 20 to 30 percent that they were supposed to give. What's an offering? An offering is anything above and beyond that 10 percent. So our church, we give 11 percent away to help plant churches all over the globe. We give 10 percent plus one. We give a tithe and an offering. We give 11 percent away. Okay. So that's what tithe and offering is. So where is this rooted, though? Why would God say, you're robbing me? This is rooted in this idea, and this is going to be really, really hard for us to, to get, get into our brains, but this is it's what the Bible says, and you've got to make a decision whether you're going to believe what God says or you're going to believe what you say or what other people have told you. What does God's Word say? God's Word says in Psalm chapter 50, verse 12, the world... And its fullness are mine. Another, who created this world? God. Okay. If you create something, do you own it? Well, it depends on the licensing agreement. But generally, yes. If you create it, it's yours. Story about a little boy, made this little boat, 
floats it down the river. It floats down the river. It gets away from him. He, he loses it for a month. He goes with his dad. They go on a journey. They get back to the little house or get, go to this town. He's walking by a little pawn shop. He sees the boat that he made, and he sees it. And he goes in there, and he says, that's my boat. And the pawn shop owner says, I, I don't know you. And he goes, well, how much you want for it? He goes, I want a dollar. The little boy goes and asks his dad, he goes, can I have a dollar? He goes, yeah, you can have a dollar. Gets the dollar, pays it, gets out, walks out, just happy as he could be with his little boat. He looks at it, he goes, I made you, I bought you. You are double mine. If you make it, it's yours. If you buy it, it's yours. Right? God made the world. He made it. And this is the fundamental understanding behind all the tithes and offerings. God says, I own all of this. You are not the owner. You are a steward. You are to manage what I have entrusted to you. So this idea of giving God 10%, it's not that he is trying to steal 10% out of your pocket. It's he, is, he, he could claim 100% of it if he wanted to. He's letting you enjoy what he has given. See it? That's a different way of looking at it. But that is the underlying foundational concept behind Malachi saying what God has said, you are robbing me. By keeping that away from God, they were essentially stealing from him. One of our kids long, long time ago, and honestly, I can't remember which one of the kids I did this with. Um, Silas is here today, Karis is here today, Katie is not here, so we'll say it's Katie, just, you know, since she's not here to defend herself. But they were being stingy and selfish and, you know, saying that word that kids learn all too early in life, mine. And fighting and fussing over stuff. And I got them by the hand, walked back there, set them down in the room, I just started pointing at stuff. Just started pointing at the that uh, pointing at things that I knew that were, you know, pretty basic to them that they wouldn't think of. Like, whose ceiling fan is that? And they're like, mine. I'm like, no, it's mine. Whose bed is that? That's my bed. No, that's mine. Who's Star Wars? Lego, Barbie, truck, flower, whatever. Just started pointing to all the different things. Whose is that? After about 10 or 15 times, they stopped saying mine. And they started saying, it's yours. I was trying to get a biblical concept into their mind to say, like, listen, you didn't create any of this stuff. You didn't buy any of this stuff. It's all a gift that's been entrusted to you, and you're to manage it well. But it's not yours. You don't own it. You're not taking any of it with you. Matter of fact, just looking around at this room, you're like, most of this is going to wind up in a garage sale for way less than what we paid for it. Guess what? You can go look around at your house, and it's the same thing. It's going to wind up at Goodwill one of these days or Deseret or wherever. It, it, but it, it's not going to last forever. Who made this? The principle is this. It all belongs to God. We are only stewards. It all belongs to him. That is the foundational principle behind the accusation Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? How are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are not bringing what is rightly deservedly mine, God said. So, next question. Was tithing central to their repentance? Yes. Absolutely it was. Tithing was central to the covenant obedience, and without covet, covenant obedience, no... There was no evidence that conversion had occurred. And you say, well, why is that so important? Because without demonstrable conversion, the glory of God is muted amongst his people. 
And God didn't just desire to save his people. He desired to save people from all tribes, all nations, all languages. And this is not just something that is in Revelation, not something that is just in New Testament, but this is evidence even in the Old Testament. And it goes as far back as the Exodus when God sent signs and wonders to deliver his people out of slavery and out of bondage in Egypt before there was ever a temple, before there was ever even a tabernacle. The Bible says that there was a mixed multitude that went with them. That meant that there were some Egyptians that saw the power and the glory of God and decided to go with the Jews, with the Hebrews, with those who had been enslaved. They left their own country, they left their own nation, they left their own nationality, their own comforts because they saw that God was with this people. And that has always been God's way that he wants to show up and show out amongst his people. He wants his people to be a display of his glory so that more people can become his people. That's what he has always wanted. But when God's people don't obey his laws, don't love him, are cynical about him, and and don't worship him how he has prescribed them to worship him, that glory leaves the building. So he says in verse 9, you are cursed with a curse. You're robbing me. The whole nation of you. This is the idea of corporate guilt. Certainly there were some people among the people that were being faithful. But corporately, they were all guilty of this. In college, I was working three jobs. I was thinking about Mary and Lori. Trying to figure out how I was going to buy a house. Start a family. All good things. All good things. It's good and right to want to get married. It's good and right to want to have kids. It's good and right to want to work hard. And I was giving to my church. But I wasn't happy about it. I don't know if that is any of you or not. It could be. I, I've been there. I wasn't happy about it. And I wasn't making very much. I mean, I was a co- full-time college student. I was working three different jobs. And I, I mean, it wasn't much money. I mean, maybe maybe six, $7,000 for the year. Which, let's just go ahead and figure up on the high end what the tithe is on that. Anybody want to guess that? $700. Go ahead and divide that by 12. I don't know what that is. Y'all, y'all got calculators. But wasn't much. And I, there was a voice that popped in my head, and it, was, and, and it was Scripture. God loves a cheerful giver. And there was another voice that popped in right behind it. You're not being very cheerful about it. Why don't you just not give it? Because your heart's not right. And you know what I said to myself? Self? That sounds like a great idea. And I stopped. I was like, it doesn't matter that this church is way bigger. They're not missing this $700 on the year, which is probably less than $100 a month. Matter of fact, I know it is because I can do that kind of math. I know it's not that much. It's fine. The next few months were cursed. Car broke down. Had to sell my beloved 68 Camaro that I had restored to fix it, which was a piece of junk. It was a Ford Bronco 2. I sold a 68 Camaro to fix a Ford Bronco 2. Just let the weight of that wash over you. Nothing was going right. I couldn't stay on top of my assignments because I was working on this stupid car. I had to quit one of the jobs. Like the dominoes just kept falling. Do you ever feel Like curse, like no matter what you do, it's not working out right. That's how the children of Israel felt here in Malachi. And God is calling them to return to him. 
He's bringing awareness of why they're actually cursed. And he's calling them to action. He's calling them to do something that's uncomfortable. In verse 10, we see that. But before we get to there, let me just ask you. Do you ever feel that way? Do you just feel cursed like nothing you do works out? Let me ask you this. Have you tried repentance? Have you tried repentance? Are there things that you're holding on to that you won't let go of? And they don't even they may not even be related. Like, don't sit here and think that just because you start giving to the church that all of a sudden you're going to become a millionaire. No, it doesn't always work out like that. Sometimes when you repent in one area, blessing ha- starts happening in this other area. God called his people to bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test. This is an interesting verse. How many other times in Scripture have you ever heard of God saying, put me to the test? Most of the time in Scripture, God's like, don't test me. Don't try me. But here... In this area, God says, no, I'm inviting you to test me. I'm inviting you to try me. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing so that there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil or the vine of the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. And then what does he say? It brings it back around to that big overarching purpose then all the nations of then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight says the lord of hosts my glory will return and all the world will know that the lord god is god so this is the action to take this is the action to take to step toward obedience to step toward generosity to step toward giving and away from taking. So the next question then is, do Christians have to tithe? Does the Old Testament requirement, the law, tithing, does that carry over into the New Testament? Am I robbing God if I don't tithe? That's the, that's the buzz question. Because I know that some of you, if you don't tithe, you're wondering and you may feel all kinds of guilt right now. And you're sitting there thinking up in your head. You're thinking up like, okay, I make this and my wife makes this. And I know what that is. And he's already given us an arithmetic lesson on 10%. And I can calculate the 10% on that. And I know what I've given to the church. I'm fixing to get a you know, W-9 for this year. And I'm pretty sure it's not going to be that amount. And then others of you, you, you're, you know that you, you, you tithe. And you can't feel self-righteous about that. You can't. Get proud about that. I'm thankful. But that is the question that we, it comes down to. It's like, well, do Christians have to tithe? The, the, the New Testament doesn't say anything about tithing. Or does it? Paul answers this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. He gives pretty clear instruction to a church. He says this. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. And we'll stop right there. If your heart right now feels like, is you feel reluctant and you feel like I am trying to compulse you into give, I just want to tell you, uh, listen, we're okay. We're going to meet budget this year. We're okay. I'm not trying to squeeze blood out of a turnip. I'm not calling you a turnip. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying, I'm, I'm not, that's not what I'm trying to do. Okay? We're going to be okay. Like, I, I'm not going to miss any meals. Okay? But we're, we're still going to be able to meet here in January. We're, the church is still going to go on. God has provided for our church. It's not all on your shoulders. Okay? I'm not trying to compulse you. I love you. Okay? 
verse 8. Or, well, finish up with verse 7. For God loves a cheerful giver. How about that? Heard that somewhere before? Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, He has distributed freely, He has given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Here's what I'm going to say about tithing and giving in the New Testament era. Okay? Tithing per se is not a Christian requirement or a stipulation. You're going to be hard-pressed to find in the New Testament where it says, thou shalt give 10% of your income. You're, you're, going to have, you're not going to find that law. What you are going to find is this generosity that abounds even more so. The early church in the book of Acts, people came that had second homes, sold those homes, gave the proceeds to the apostles, and distributed as any had need. Now, I don't know if any of you have a second home. My guess is that's probably more than a tithe. But you also don't have to do it. And they didn't have to, but some of them did. This is why Paul says each one must decide in his heart what he is going to give. He didn't say people should decide whether or not they're going to give. He said decide in your heart what you're going to give. So that's why here at the table, we don't, Make tithing for membership at a church at this church. It's not a requirement. We have no New Testament grounds to stand on for that. There are expectations as you rise in leadership. Like we think if you're going to be an elder of the church, you should probably tithe. You need to demonstrate like generosity. I don't I don't go around checking that stuff, but we 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 do. If you're going to be on the finance team, you should demonstrate that kind of generosity. If you're going to handle God's people's money, you should be obedient in that area of your life. Okay? So tithing per se is not a Christian requirement or a stipulation of the new covenant, but financial giving most definitely is. It's, you, you can't just say it's not in there. It is in there. And Paul affirms that there is definitely a connection between generosity and reward. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. He definitely makes that connection. So here's my pastoral counsel. This is the action. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you give. I, I don't know how much or what. I don't know any of those amounts. If you don't, I would encourage you to start. To start somewhere. And I mean it may be minuscule. It may be small. $5 a, a, a week, $5 a month, if that's all you can do. Start somewhere and make it regular. Just set it up and make it regular. I've taught my kids from the time they were a little bitty, I'm like, just tithe. That's a good thing to just go ahead and set that in there. For uh, It's not a requirement, but I've encouraged them to do that. And they tithe off birthday money. You know, it was income, you know. Now, if you say, well, I think that's a terrible way to parent. Well, that's fine. Parent your kids however you want to. They're mine. Leave me alone. So. <laughs> like, that's what I'm doing. Like, I'm not asking you to raise my kids. And I'm not asking to raise yours. <laughs> Start somewhere. Make it regular. All right. Say that you are giving. And, but you're aware. You're like, okay. I kind of feel a little bit of conviction here. I feel like I'm not. I, I, could, I could probably do better than this. All right. Sit down. If you're married, don't, don't go rogue on this. Involve your spouse, okay? This is one of those things where you kind of like talk to saying, sit down, make a plan. Comfort, financial comfort is not the goal. Obedience is the goal. Obedience to God is the goal, okay? Um, I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a basic example. And I'm, this is not to guilt anybody or anything, but just, just an example, okay? I desperately want to drive a new truck. But I don't. I drive a 2002 Ford Excursion that has a 7.3 diesel motor that has 406,000 miles on it. 
I'm getting ready to take it to Oklahoma at Christmas, and I'm going to pray a lot. Okay? I would really like to have a brand new platinum edition F-250 6.7 Ford truck. But I, but <laughs> and here's the thing. I could, I could go do it. But I can't, I can't give what I give to this church and make that truck payment. So I choose this one over here. Okay? I, I don't know what changes you have to make. It, you, it's probably going to be some sacrifices. And it's okay. Can I just tell you as somebody who's walked in this for a long, long time, I've never regretted being obedient in the area of finances and giving to and through my local church. I've never regretted seeing the kingdom of God expanded through my local church. I've never regretted it. And I would encourage you to take a step toward that. I have to do without some things. But clearly... I've not missed too many meals. Okay? I'm okay. And you'll be, you will be too. So, Paul the Apostle roots this. He roots this exhortation toward money. He roots it in the gospel. Number Verse 9, he says this. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. We were poor spiritually. Christ, who is rich spiritually, died for us. So that he could give us what we could not have on our own. He, this is what Christ does for us. Malachi reminded the Jewish community that the Lord does not change. He is faithful to his promises. Even when they were not. And the Lord, Lord is faithful to his promises even when we are not. We should not presume upon his grace. But it is good for us to remember that the Lord does not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. He's not going to let us be forsaken. If you take a step in obedience, he's not going to let you be forsaken. He's not, he just is not going to do that. He will sustain. He will provide. He will bless. Test him. Try him. So, four invitations, and we'll wrap this thing up. Invitation number one, I want to invite you to salvation. Where are you with the Lord? What's your relationship with him like? Are you near him or are you far away from him? Like if I were to ask you the question, where would you go if you were to die today? And if you were to say, well, I don't know. Well, that means you're probably not where you need to be. If you say, I'll go to heaven. And if I were to ask you why, why do you say that? If you say, well, I. And you start with reasons for why you deserve to go to heaven you've already made a mistake the proper answer is because he because of Christ because of what Christ has done for me so is your hope and your dependence on Christ and in Christ alone not on your own doing you can return to him today he made you he sent Christ to die on the cross he's already purchased your salvation will you believe in him today will you trust in him today the Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved you can simply pray today Jesus I give my life to you would you forgive me of my sin I want to take you as my savior will you save me you can pray that in your own words you can repeat just right after what I said that he'll save you and then I want you to tell somebody number two I want to invite you to generosity and obedience. How generous are you? It's a good question to ask your wife or your husband or your best friend. Ask yourself, does your generosity reflect how freely he has given to you? Are you closer to your money than you are to your Lord? What needs to change? Consider that before taking communion. Don't take communion in a presumptuous way. If there's unrepentant sin, you're being hard-hearted, obstinate, it's okay for you to sit communion out. Don't drink condemnation on yourself. The last one is an invitation to communion. What it is, is it's a reminder of the covenant, the covenant that we have in Christ, of what He has provided for us. That His body is our righteousness. His perfect life 
is imputed to us and our standing is right before God because of what He has done. And we're not presuming upon that. We're honest about our sins and we're honest about our shortcomings and we bring that before the Lord. Knowing that all of our sin is covered by His blood, which is represented by the juice. And we drink that to remind ourselves that our standing in Christ is secure. The last one is an invitation to sing. To sing to this God. To celebrate this God who is so faithful, even when we are not. To sing to this God that has been so generous toward us in giving us what we never could have bought on our own. So let me pray for you. We want to invite you to trust in Christ if you haven't. We want to invite you to take a step toward generosity. We want to invite you to come and take communion. And if that, if, if you're not a Christian, you can set that out. It's cool. If you haven't been baptized yet, you're walking in unrepentant sin, you can set that out. Not everybody's going to come up and take communion. It's okay. But after we're done with that, we're all going to stand and sing. And we do invite you to sing. This God's worthy of all of your praise and all your adoration. Okay? Let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your generosity toward us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you are faithful that you give us a way to return and it's through the blood of Christ God may we do that today in your good good name we pray amen